everyone about, which is kind of our, we're calling it a TV directing masterclass uh, with Joe Menendez. You know, it's really going to be more of a fireside chat, and I think through the conversation, just get to know a little bit about your work and sort of the craft of what you do as a, as right now, you know, you know, one of the top TV directors uh, working uh, in the industry today. Uh, you know, obviously for some of you guys that haven't read Joe's bio, you know, he's got just a, a long career of doing everything from feature films, uh, Ladron Que Roba Ladron, right? Uh, that was a Lionsgate release. And of course on the TV side, uh, shows like Star Trek Picard, which is on Paramount Plus now, and uh, Kung Fu on the CW Network. And you know so many other credits and, and accolades, and you know one of the best for me is that you're you're a hometown hero as well from Miami. So please welcome Joe Sanders. Do the same thing you're doing. There you go. Uh, yeah, I'm from Hialeah. I'm a Hialeah boy. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know what they say about Miami? All roads lead to Hialeah. It's the Rome of Miami-Dade County. <laughs> 22 years in Hialeah, uh, from Hialeah to L.A. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a heck of a journey. I, I'm, I'm excited to jump into it. Let's start at the beginning of your journey, and, and let's take it back now from L.A. to, to Hialeah. So tell us a little about yourself, uh, where you grew up, how you grew up, and a little bit of that first spark that you thought maybe this could be not only a, a passion, but a career. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I grew up in Hialeah. I was born in, in, in New York City. My parents are Cuban. I was raised in Hialeah, and um, you know the spark to make movies started when I saw Star Wars. Uh, and I'm dating myself now. I was seven when Star Wars came out, and um, but it, but initially I wanted to be a Disney animator. So I draw, and I wanted to be a cartoonist, and I wanted to draw Mickey Mouse. I wanted to do all of that. And um, what happened is I saw Star Wars, and the moment I saw Star Wars, I was fascinated with movies, and I didn't know how that was made or where that was made. So um, I asked my mother where that was made, and she said Hollywood. And that was the first time I'd heard the term Hollywood. Um, and so I commandeered my grandmother's Super 8 movie camera. Again, dating myself, this is how long, how far back this goes. And um, the Super 8 movie camera, initially the idea was I was going to shoot all these cartoons that I had drawn. I'd actually drawn all these animated cartoons, and I was going to actually shoot a cartoon because my real ambition when I was a boy was to be an animator. Right. The camera didn't come with single frame. So I couldn't shoot, I couldn't film the animation. Oh, wow. So then I took the camera, I'm like, well, if I can't do animation, I'll just do live action for now until I find a camera. I never got a camera that could do single frame, so I just started making movies with my, with my brother and my cousins and made a ton of Super 8 movies growing up, junior high, high school. I was one of those that from a very young age, I knew that I wanted to be a director. And it started um, really in 1982, I read this article in the Miami Herald there used to be a critic for the Miami Herald, his name was Bill Cosford, who's passed away. And um, he had done an interview with Steven Spielberg. Mm. And in that interview, Spielberg jokingly said his biggest nightmare is that somebody will invent a machine that directs movies. Wow. And then he said, and if that happens, what will I do for a living? And it was just like, an, uh, you know, like, like a joke. But right. the last yeah. sentence, which was, what will I do for a living? Because I hadn't considered filmmaking as a career. Mm. Because I grew up in Hialeah, I grew up in the projects, very poor, government cheese, government peanut butter, all that stuff, as right. poor as I come, as disconnected, far away from Hollywood as, as you can come. Mm. But, you know, and I thought, like, I don't know what I'm going to do, I, you know, like, how am I going to ever do this? But when I saw that, and I saw the words, how will I do, how, you know, so, so what will I do for a living? Um, I went to my mother, and I'm like, this is what I'm going to do for a living. This is a job, Mom. I can go do this, this directing thing, the thing that I'm doing with my brother and cousins. I can actually make a living doing this. And my mother was like patting me on the head. Like, All right, great. Good luck to that. <laughs> and then literally 12 years later, or 10 years later, I was like, Mom, I'm going to L.A. And I went wow. to L.A., and I did 30 years in L.A. 30 years? 30 years, wow. and I just recently moved back uh, here. Welcome so, back, by the which way. Which I'm excited to be back here. <laughs> That's I finally amazing. feel like I'm home again. Yeah, and you are. Yeah, uh, but, that's... but I've been very fortunate because the moment I got there, I just made short films, and, I would sh and, and, and these were the days before Vimeo and YouTube where I had to right. physically show a VHS tape. I had to send VHS tapes to people wow. to watch these things. And I had made a number of short films um, and trying to get people to watch them. And, yeah. you know, and it's not like sending a link. It's so easy. Like, I, I'm actually rather envious of today's generation because 
you know, you've got a movie studio in your pocket with your phone. Right. And you can edit on your computer and you can then, you know, put it up on Vimeo and send the link out. It's more challenging now because everyone's getting a link. Right. So how do you get somebody to look at your link and not someone else's link? Um, so in those days, it was VHS tape. So I had to physically send out through the mail or drop off, you know, physical VHS tapes. And sometimes they would send them back and I could see where they stopped watching. Right. Oh, you know? okay. And so you... And, 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 <laughs> <laughs> but what that does is it allows you to deconstruct because you can go, why did they stop it there? Which right. is what I would do. I would deconstruct my own work. And when it wasn't working, I'm like, why are they stopping it there? And I found sometimes that it was consistent, that it would stop in the same places. Interesting. Um, and so you can go back and go, well, why isn't it working? And then you start sort of modeling your thing so that they don't stop it. Wow. You know? So you were doing like early Google Analytics almost for like <laughs> <laughs> analog analytics. analog analytics. <laughs> That's, right. That's incredible. But yeah, and, and your or origin story is obviously great. Uh, you know, and and between making the Super Eight movies and wanting to be an animation, it's almost like you're a mix of of Spielberg and Walt Disney. Well, I, I, I you with know, some I'll, Propa Vieja thrown in. With some Propa Vieja <laughs> thrown in. I, you know, I, 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 it's 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 funny because Spielberg was it for me. I mean, I, you know, and I, you know, when I saw Star Wars. It's, I, you know, it's ironic that I've done Star Trek because I wasn't a, you know, don't tell them, but I wasn't a Trekkie. Uh -oh. um, you know, growing up, I wasn't. I've now become a Trekkie. But right. I wasn't a Trekkie. I was a Star Wars guy, and, then, and I was a Disney guy. I saw a lot right. of that stuff. And it's, and it's interesting that, um, and, 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 you know, we can get into this, but um, in the 90s, there were a lot of sort of guys with guns movies being made right. in, in, in those days. And um, I, I learned a valuable lesson about branding, um, that, that I went away from the kind of things that I loved watching and I just started like I'm going to make what's trendy and sometimes as filmmakers we're like well what is it that people want to see you know what are the you know what, what's the hot thing you know and so in those days it was guys with guns movies like in these days it's it's horror movies but if you're not a horror person if you're not somebody that's into that kind of thing then, right. then you shouldn't have done it. but anyway so I did so I so that's why my career has sort of been this meandering thing mm. um, because I've done every single genre and so you know, generously, you could say my career has been eclectic, yeah. but but really, what I say, it's been all over the place, and it's only it's <laughs> only in the last like twelve, thirteen years where I've sort of specifically branded myself as a genre guy, like doing this kind of thing, right. uh, which has always been the sweet spot. Like it's always been the thing that I've always loved, and I think it's imperative as filmmakers that we say this is this is the thing that I'm good at, and and it's not that as storytellers we don't want to tell different kinds of stories, yeah. but I think we we all have certain aptitudes and certain you know. Um, abilities that are better suited for certain kinds of stories. And I think the sooner you can identify that, the better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense uh, in terms of, of that trajectory and how you kind of found your way. Uh, in terms of the journey from Hialeah to L.A., um, other than, you know, obviously a, a great tool to make films when you were so young, you know, even in the backyard, did you have any formal training? Did you go to film school? Um, or did you just kind of throw yourself onto sets? Like, how did you get more formal training later on? Yes. Okay. No. Um, it's, it's all of the above. <laughs> it's, it's all of the above. I mean, honestly, I, and, and this is not to sound flippant um, towards school, I, I, I went to Miami-Dade um, and dropped out uh, to move to L.A. Um, by the time I got to Miami-Dade, I had already been making Super 8 movies and 16mm movies um, all through junior high and high school. Wow. So when I was 18 and I took my first class at Miami-Dade, the professor would stand up there, and I was that arrogant little asshole 18-year-old, because the, you know, the, he starts to talk, and he's like, well, this is what you do, and it's, and it's basically teaching film 101, right? which, is, right. which has to happen, right? sure. which is imperative. And he was like, well, this is how you do it. You do this, and then I would raise my hand. I'm like, well, you can actually do, and then and I would give him, and then he's like, yes, true, but, and then I would get into debates. So about two weeks into this class, the professor pulls me aside, and he's like, look, Clearly, you know this stuff, but you've got to let the other students learn it because they don't. And so I became a teacher's aide. So like, wow. so I would stay after class, and I would be, you know, like, uh, you know, like how the camera works. Like mm. there were people that honestly, it was the first time they had held a camera. Wow. It wasn't my first time, but it was, it, 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 it was theirs. So my training, by the time I got into college, was you know I had already, you know, like I. I, I grew up in Hialeah, like I said. So there was a, there was a library, uh, I think it's on 49th Street. JFK? Uh, the JFK Library. Yes, yeah. I mean. Uh, <laughs> I, I spent so much time right. in the back of that library, and I read every single book. And this was the days before that you can Google these things. And I sat, and I remember I sat, like, I would take the bus to right. JFK Library, and I would sit, and it was in the back. Like, the movie and film section was in the back. Right. And I would sit on the floor, and I went through 
every single book wow. in, in, in the library, and I read them all. Like, I was not a kid that went, you know, like, I played sports, but, you know, and I wasn't, you know, that much of a nerd, <laughs> but, right. but I was definitely a nerd that I wanted, to, like, I, I, I was obsessed. <laughs> I was a nerd light. Um, I, I, <laughs> Hipster, I, they call them now. Yeah, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Geeks is what we're known now. Thank you. No, but I read, but I read everything. I wanted to know everything, and, you know, and, and, you know, nowadays you could just Google something. Right. In those days, I had to go and open a book and read the book, and right. I would read all these books. So, um, that was really what I felt was my formative training. Right. All that Miami Dade gave me, frankly, was access to equipment. And, you know, the year before I had gotten there, you know, so the reason I went to Miami Dade, I was like, I'm going to go to Miami Dade because in year one, they allowed you to make movies on 16 millimeter. Whereas like UM and places like that, you had to start at Super 8. And right. I was like, well, I've been doing Super 8. I don't want to do Super 8 again. I want to do 16 millimeter. And the year before I got there, um, this guy, Angel Gracia, had won the Student Academy Award at Miami Dade wow. for a movie. I think it was called Four Cornered Hat or something like that. I forget what it was called. But anyway, he had won the Student Academy Award. So I felt like, oh, I'm using... The, the hallowed equipment that Angel Gracia used. And, um, but it, so, you know, I did all my film classes. And, as I was, and then so I had all my core classes to take. And then right around the time that I was going to start taking my core classes, a friend of mine said, hey, I'm driving out to L.A. Do, do you want to go? And I dropped everything. And off wow. I went. And off and, you went. And my mother was like, you know, but you got to finish college. I'm like, yeah, mom, I'll do it in L.A. When I get back. <laughs> no, I, said, I told her I'll do it. I'm like, mom, they got the best film schools in L.A. And like, you got to work. And I showed up right. to L.A. with 200 bucks in my pocket, a bunch of short films that I had made. Yeah. Um, and that was it. And I just had to start working and, and you know, started sending out the VHS tapes. And, and that work that involved, uh, did you PA? Did you just spend a lot of time on sets? Yeah, I was uh, my first, well, I, I, did, I did a lot of sort of, like I was the ticket taker at Universal Studios <laughs> ripping tickets. I was, okay. um, but, then, but I did do the PA thing. But um, I worked at Star Search. Um, I was okay. a PA on Star Search. Wow. Um, I did a lot of running for Saban Entertainment, I, um, which at the time they were doing the Power Rangers, the, 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 the sort of American version of the Power Rangers, where they were taking the, I think it was from Japan, um, they were taking the show and then they were having American actors. So they were taking all the fight scenes, but then they were doing like, like, like the in-between stuff, right. you know, with American actors. And, uh, and I remember, and I was like, what is this Mighty Morphin Power Rangers thing? And, and I remember that I had to drive the red helmet to set one day. Ooh. And, and I, it was sitting on my seat with the costume. I had to drive it to set. And I was like, that show's going to suck. That's never, ah! that's never going to go anywhere. And like, little <laughs> did I know, you know. But uh, so I did that. I did that for a number of years. But the entire time that I was doing that, you know, now, now they call them, you know, like, you know you've got to have your side hustle. Right. I mean, in those days, I was always writing. I was always trying to make my movies, trying to, you know. And anybody that I would meet, I would say, you know, I'm a director. I want you to watch something. And in those days, you had to sit them down. Sure. And put in a VHS tape or a DVD later, and like here you go, right. because it's it's nowadays you could just I'll send you a link to the thing I'm right. the thing I'm working on. But um, it was a constant. I think we were talking about it at lunch that it was a constant source of, you know, it, it's ambition meets you know enthusiasm meets insanity. Yeah, it's, a lot of persistence. Yeah, obviously. it really is. Yes. It really uh, is. But it's just little by little, and then I and then what ended up happening is I made a number of short films in LA just on my own. Uh, that I paid for, like I, you know, like it's, 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 um, you know, I was in debt all the time because I was constantly maxing right. my credit cards to try to make these short films. And then I, I made this short film called Mother's Little Hitman about, about, about a hitman who sees his mother's dead ghost on every hit that he goes on. It's so stupid. But, but <laughs> anyway, you know, that was enough. That should be a limited the, series. I like <laughs> Mother's Little. Anyway, that film, it, it, there was a, because I sent it to every single show in town. And the only show, there was a show called Real Stories of the Highway Patrol. And this was in the days of America's Most Wanted sure. and cops and all that. And they were doing a lot of, re like, you know, uh, uh, like reenactment type things. And so it was a show that was, and I sent it on a whim because I had one more tape. And I was like, all right, I guess I'll send it to this Real Stories of the Highway Patrol. They're the only ones that called me. Wow. So I was like, yes, I got a job. And like they gave me, I was, um, I, I, I turned 25 on set. Uh, I was 24 uh, and I turned 25 on set, you know. Thank you. You want, you want to no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, <laughs> I did ask him before the panel, just so you know. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm joking. Thank you. Um, the, uh, but anyway, but I was, yeah, I, I, I got hired on Real Stories, and, and, uh, uh, and I remember that I celebrated my 25th birthday um, wow. directing reenactments for the, for the show, which, oh was, my gosh. which was a lot of At fun. Oh, my gosh. At 25. 25. Jeez. Like, flying all over the country directing 
shootouts and car chases and all that kind of it was like you know it, it was it was like a, a it was like a boy's dream yeah. and it was it was a it was a really tricky show because uh it was reenactment so we would hire actors to play the bad guys right sure. but the cops that the incident was based on would actually play themselves oh wow so it was a really weird thing because the like, cops are good cops but they're not always good actors so, sure. so, you know, and, and, you know, so, uh, so, you know, so, so, so you're trying to, you know, get a performance out of uh, like a real police officer. And then the other thing was like, they were also their own technical advisor. Mm. So like, I'm in my head trying to do the things that I've seen on TV shows and movies for the longest time. Like, right. wouldn't it be cool if you kind of came out and was like, well, we wouldn't do that. Right. And then I was constantly like, well, but it would look cool. You know, so it was this, so it depended on the cop. Like some cops were like, whatever, let's do it. You know, right, and the other right. cops were like, no, we do not do that. You know, but, but it was a great learning ground to stage action scenes and you know sure. and like I didn't know that people actually did it like this but I just to me it just made sense I bought all these like Hot Wheels cars so okay. when I was doing car chases I would sit on the street that we we're about to stage this, and I would go and here's car A and here's car B and then you skid and you do this and it turns out that in real like w when I started doing like big shows right. they did the exact same thing I'm like yeah well the thing I was doing when I was a kid that's the exact I knew it all thing. along that's what, that's, what, <laughs> that's what they do now uh, but, uh, but no it was, uh, it was great and then from then it just started Snowballing, and you know there were like peaks and valleys where things didn't right. go right and things did go, but but that's that was essentially the start of it. Absolutely. And so from there, did you continue to do T We Were? Because at some point, obviously, you also directed features. Yeah. So how did that transition happen? Was that a planned thing, or you just found, wrote, got found some scripts, got some opportunities? How did you kind of break into the feature world? Well, what's interesting is that is that um, as directors, um, for whatever reason, features are sort of the the high mark you know right. that we all strive for we're like we want to make features but if you want a career you go into television absolutely you know if, if you want to because features you spend so much of your time chasing money so much of your money trying to find financing for your for for, for your movie and in in the meantime you've got all your bills you've got a family you've got all, you know and so you're struggling the entire time and then suddenly it's feast or famine like suddenly you get you know you find the money for your movie and then you're like I'm doing great look at all this money I'm making and then but then you know Suddenly it all runs out, whereas in TV, you can have a sustained career. Um, I, wanted, I was chasing feature films for a long time before, and, but in the meantime, where the phone was constantly ringing was in television. So um, I did a number of movies, including, as you said, Ladron, Quetobo Ladron, but I had made a, um, some other independent movies prior to that, which is how I got Ladron, um, which was, again, a project that came up. And so Ladron came up, because uh, I had made two indie movies that nobody's seen that are on that you should not buy, but, but, <laughs> but they're available, but don't get them. Um, but, uh, and uh, so what had happened is Lionsgate wanted to make, uh, they, they asked a the question, they said, why aren't we making movies in Spanish right. in Hollywood? And, it, it, and, and in the earliest days of Hollywood, they used to do that. Um, you know, like the most famous example of this was Universal used to make, they actually, the Bela Lugosi version of Dracula I heard about this. There's actually yeah, yeah. a Spanish language version that it's actually arguably better right. than the Bela Lugosi. But what? Well, but they shot the Bela Lugosi version during the day, and right. then they would wrap at six, right. and at six thirty, from till six thirty in the morning, the Spanish crew would come in, and right. they would shoot on the exact same sets. It would shoot the exact same script, but they would do the movie in Spanish. Um, and this was something that they just did to service different markets. Right. Um, and it was, it's actually a great story because like they were competitive with one another and they were sabotaging each other and like oh, really? to, yeah they were trying to outdo each other so it's a there's a great movie there, uh, <laughs> but anyhow um, uh, it, it, so they, they they stopped doing it for a number of different reasons for right. decades and so uh, they said okay so we want to make Hollywood movies but we want to make them in Spanish, we need people that have sort of Hollywood sensibilities but understand the language and can speak to the actors in Spanish and can do the movie in Spanish but because what happens is you oftentimes get directors now not 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 so much these days because i think that hollywood has become so global hmm. that i think the uh, like i think you know from south america or europe or whatever you get directors that have hollywood sensibilities but but it's it's in those days it was more of a rare thing but now it's becoming more and more common to right. to find directors that come from somewhere else other than you know america that can do hollywood movies but uh, but anyway, but uh, who had Hollywood sensibilities but can do a movie in Spanish. And I was on a very short list of mm. people that could do this. And so they basically said, come in and p pitch a few movies. And um, I pitched uh, you know, this one idea that a friend of mine had pitched me. And it was you know, a heist that's pulled off by the people that you never think about, that you don't think about. The people that you flip your keys to but have access to highly secure places. 
the maid, the gardener, the valet, mm-hmm. all those people. So they pull off a heist against somebody that, that really deserves it. So we always called it, so I pitched it as a poor man's Ocean's Eleven, is what I said. Nice. And so And it sold to Lionsgate, and um, my wife who's here somewhere was, was the producer on it. And oh, wow. um, she, uh, so, so we, we got the movie financed, and, and, and it went, and it, you know, did well, and a sequel, like, like, like we made a sequel to it. So, you know, the feature thing is always something that I've, that I've loved, but what I've only realized really in the last five or six years is it's exhausting to chase the feature thing. Right. And, and as much as we all love movies, I find it that it's just as gratifying to do, especially the kind of TV shows that I'm doing now sure. are just as gratifying as any movie that I've ever done. You know, I just did a show called Snowpiercer, um, for TNT and um, oh, thank you. Cool show. some Snowpiercer fans um, and I, I had a great time on that you know and, and it was it, it, it satisfied every single nerdy geeky instinct of mine in terms of genre in terms of action in terms of emotion like it had it all you know Kung Fu does it uh, Star Trek Picard you know does it 12 Monkeys all these shows that I've been doing feed into that right. they, they feed into the thing that I am as an artist because again, you know, you, you, you have to be able to identify what kind of stories you love telling. And I'm telling them in television. So why am I gonna chase features when I'm doing the thing that I love in television? Mm. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And so, but you know, obviously, like you said, you had a couple of successful features. You could have probably said like, continue to chase that. Uh, so at one point, did you decide to pivot and how did you pivot back to television? Well, I was always doing television. Okay, so, so throughout this whole process, you were basically... Te- the phone was always ringing. Right. What, what the, the pivoting was more about genre. Because mm-hmm. I was, my career was so all over the place, I did you know, a reality TV. I've done Spanish language TV. I've done comedy. I've done family. I've done rom-com. After, what, what, what happens is when you have this sort of, and again, generously eclectic resume, is an executive or a producer looks at that and they don't see what their show is. So they see like, well, clearly this guy's done a ton of stuff. He's got a ton of credits. But I don't know if he could do my show because he, he's got all this other stuff, but is he the thing that I'm looking for? Right. So, you know, it, it, what I realized is I was, I was, since I was occupationally promiscuous. <laughs> I was, okay. I was, it was, so <laughs> I, I, did, I did whatever. And, and, and I think that's part of my working class roots that like the phone rings and I would just say yes. Because right. a job's a job. You're like, all right, I'll go do that Spanish language thing. And like, okay, I'll go do that family thing. Right. And you, decades go by, and you realize, like, I'm a mess. Like, nobody knows what I am. And so I had to, and it was very difficult, I had to, um, this was about 12, 13 years ago, um, maybe more, I had to stop taking the calls. Because, mm-hmm. and, and I had to say, I am now transitioning from family and comedy. I'm going to start doing drama. Mm. Television. This is the thing that I that, that I and and it was with my agents and my manager it was a tough period. I was going to say, did yeah. you have representation at the time yeah. that was kind of walking you through that transition? Uh, the, I I was walking them through it. Right. I was going to say they're they, resistant because, to not getting a paycheck. No, they were like, <laughs> well, how could you say no to Disney? Right. Disney wants to hire you to do these three episodes, and then behind that, two more. And and I didn't want to get to the age I'm at now and say, oh my god, this is all I. And, and by the way, I'll, I'll I'll preface it by saying. Uh, had it been that way, and had I stayed in, the, the, you know, doing Disney, Nickelodeon stuff, it would have been fine, and I would have made a right. great career, uh, and, and I would have done things that, that would have made me happy, but I knew that I would have constantly been wondering about that other thing, mm. and I didn't want to have a moment in my career where I was like, God, I should have gone down that path, and I think that's sort of the moral to, to this story, is recognizing what kind of filmmaker you are, and where you're best suited, and brand yourself right. into that. Right, absolutely. So once you made that transition, what was that first show that you felt, okay, now I'm in my wheelhouse and, and what I, I really want to be doing? Yeah, it, I, so I'd made two, two transitions myself. I'd made a number of indie films I, you know, and some TV movies that were more drama. You right. know? Um, but the thing that sort of really put me over the top, this was in 2012, I got a call to do From Dust Till Dawn. Uh-huh. And Robert Rodriguez was doing the TV series version of his movie. Mm. Um, and um, my friend Carlos Cotto, um, who you know as well. Another fellow Cuban-American. Another yeah. fellow Cuban, yeah. yeah. And he, he was running the show. And what, it, 
what had happened was Carlos came to a screening of Ladron Quero Ladron. And Carlos is someone that when he got to LA, he didn't bullshit around. He identified exactly what he wanted to be and did that. Like he knew right. he was a television writer right. who would write genre. Mm. And from the mid 90s or whenever it was that he got to LA, that's what he did. He was hyper focused on one thing and he's thrived because, and that's what he's done. And he's, and you know, and, and so anyway, he came to a screening that I had at Technicolor right next to Universal in, in LA, if, if, if you know, mm. know where that is. And um, he, saw this, he saw the movie, enjoyed the movie. After the screening, he came up to me and said, oh my God, I enjoyed the movie so much. I think you should come do television for me. I wow. think you should come do TV shows. And at the time, I, fr I forget what he was doing. I think he was doing Nikita or something. I forget what he was doing. And, um, but I had that thing in my head that I go, oh, I'm a feature guy. Did you not just see? I made You're a feature. Right. <laughs> You're here standing here in my screening, sir. My, my hollow ground. <laughs> yeah, I just made a feature, sir. How dare you bring up television? And uh, no, but I was very polite. And I was like, oh, thank you very much. And I, you know, and I, I never called I never called him. I never followed up. Oh, wow. And, but Carlos stayed in touch. Oh, wow. And what would happen was um, I, had, I had done a ton of Disney things and his daughters were at that age where they were watching Disney Channel. And so he would text me and he would say, hey, I just watched an episode that you directed of Zeke and Luther. And I, I thought it was really well directed. And I was like, oh, thanks, man. I'll text him back. And that was it. And I never hit him up for a job. I never, because wow. I was like, I'm a feature guy. Sure. You know, I was like, how dare you? <laughs> you know, I was still <laughs> indignant. And then, um, and then, Several years later is when I made this transition where I was like, I'm leaving all that behind. I never thought to call him. Right. But out of the blue, he called me and he said, Why? I, he goes, and he even said to me, and I kept the email, he goes, I know you're doing stuff in the family space. I know that, you're, that you might not be interested, but I'm doing From Dust Till Dawn. Will you come over and do the show? Right. And I was like, fuck yeah. You know, and that was the, I mean, oh. and, and, and so, but I had to go through the gauntlet of meeting Robert Rodriguez, and, right. which, which was... You know, it's, it was a whole process uh, because he was in Austin and I was in L.A. And this was the days before Zoom, so I had a Skype with, with, with Robert. And, um, and, you know, and what Carlos warned me, he's like, you know, he's going to ask you a lot of questions. He's, you know, you're going to have to earn that slot, you know, to get into Because From Dust to Dawn, for Robert, is a very valuable IP. IP, yeah. yeah. So the first meeting, within five minutes, Robert says to me, um, so I noticed you've done a lot of Disney and Nickelodeon stuff. And I was like, oh boy. And he, and, 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 and he said, what makes you think that you could do horror? And I was mad for two reasons. I was mad because I was unprepared for the question because I should have been prepared. I should have known that people were going to look at my resume if I'm trying to make this transition. They're going to look at my resume and they're going to say, I, I don't understand who you are. Why are you coming here to do a horror show? You look at all your Disney and Nickelodeon stuff. So I was unprepared. And, and, and secondly, because... and then. I was indignant. I'm like, why would a director ask me this? Like, as a director, you should just look. And again, right. hubris. And in my hubris, I said to him, without thinking, I said, well, I think the guy that directed Sin City and Spy Kids ought to know that you can go back and forth between the two worlds. Whoa. And I thought, and, and the moment I said it, I wanted to like, reach into the You're ethers <laughs> and pull, pull my back. words back, but they, they were gone. <laughs> and now I'm just blink, blink, looking at Robert on the monitor, and he smiles and goes, yeah, you're right. Wow. And he moved on, and which is a credit to him being such a mensch. And, um, and then we just started talking craft. And then, and then while on Skype, I was sending him links to things that I had done that had action in it. Mm. Um, uh, because I had done the reality TV thing. I had done reenactments. I did it for real stories. And then I also did it on a show for Telemundo called Placas, which was, okay. which was 10 minute cop reenactments, like crime reenactments and all that. So I had cut like a little action reel on that. Right. And so he's like, yeah, send that to me. I'm like, oh, right now. So I sent it to him. And then he had to watch it. So for three and a half minutes, I'm watching Skype. Robert watch my thing. <laughs> and now it's awkward because I'm trying to find other things to do so it doesn't look like I'm just looking at him. So I'm like, I'm going to pretend <laughs> I'm doing things over here. But I'm really trying to watch his reaction to it. Right, right, right. And then the thing ended and he's like, oh, yeah, okay, good. And he had seen Ladron too. Oh, okay. So, he had, so that's why he was, I was even in the room because gotcha. he had seen Leatheron. Right. And, um, and so afterward, he's like, okay, great. It looks like you know what you're doing. All right, I'm going to send you the outline and I want you to pitch me your take on this outline. And he sent me the outline and then wow. like a week later, I was back on a Skype with him and I had to walk through what I was going to do and this is what I thought and da, da 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 And I went through like, honestly, like two or three other meetings with him and I finally got the job. And mm. I went to Austin and, you know, started shooting and I was about three or four days into the shoot and... At that point, I knew I wasn't going to get fired. I knew that he liked the dailies and everything. And right. then he showed up on set 
again, you know, he was always around, but he showed up, and I finally said, all right, I'm going to ask him. I'm going to go, all right, all right, because I had heard about all these horror directors that were up for the job, mm. but he chose me, right. who had never done horror. And he said, and I finally asked him, like, why me? Why did you choose me? At yeah. this point, I felt p- pretty safe and confident. <laughs> and, um, and he said, because you were the only director that didn't fixate on the horror. You fixated on the characters. Wow. You were interested in the Gecko brothers. You were interested in the Fuller family. And, and, I, and, and I knew at that point that you were obsessed with the right things. Huh. And w- where that came from was I knew that K&B, who does all the, you know, like, like the Walking Dead, they were doing all the makeup effects. Greg Nicotero, you know, before he became a director, was doing all the makeup effects. So I knew that was going to be taken care of. Robert had his VFX company, his in-house VFX company, doing all the VFX. I knew that was going to be great. And, you know, like, as long as you can articulate to, to these people what you're looking for, you're a director. Yeah. You need to be able to, what's in your brain, you need to be able to tell somebody clearly what it is that you see. And then they go do it. Sure. So I knew that was going to be great. But I wanted to make sure the characters. And it really, you can have all the spectacle in the world that you want, but if you don't have characters that you care about, then everything falls apart. The show falls apart, the episode falls apart, the movie falls apart. And so because Robert w- was... was confident that I was going to fixate on the character. I was, I was going to take care of his characters mm. that he created with Quentin Tarantino. That's why I got the job. Um, it, it, it was because I was going to take care because the other directors were like, because what happens with horror directors is they'll go um, talking, 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 ooh, horror, and right, then they right, fixate right. on that stuff, and then they're like ignoring the stuff that matters because if everything matters, but if you don't get those dialogue scenes, those character moments down, Nothing matters. Right. It's just, you're, you're just numb. Like when you see an action movie and you're just numb, it's because they didn't do the character work. Right. And particularly in television where character is so important, right? It's, it's everything. Yeah. It's everything. That's why you tune in every week. Right. Because these people become friends of yours. So you're like, oh, I want to tune in next week and see what's happening with this friend of mine. Yeah. You know. No, that's great. And so, you know, now we know that you're in your wheelhouse. You're doing great things. You're working with Robert Rodriguez, obviously a uh, good friend, J.C. Cotto. Uh, let's get into a little bit of, of process before the Q&A. So if, if, if you could pick a show and just kind of break down your process as a TV director from the moment you get the script to your on set, what would you say you know, are, are the takeaways for a potential TV director to know going in you know, about your process? It's a great question. Um, and we could, spend, we could spend a whole long time, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give the sort of overview and then, and then we can get into it in more detail if we have time. Um, but essentially, when you break it down, it, again, starts with characters. It starts with what's going on with these characters. And so tonally, what's, what's key is to understand what each scene, who each scene is about. So if, you know, I was giving this example earlier. Um, if, if uh, I'll just use the same, exact, <laughs> same example. If I'm doing a scene with, with you and me, and I'm telling you that I accidentally ran over your dog, Right? Who's the scene about? It's not about me. It's about your reaction because you just lost your dog. Right. So that informs how I stage the scene. Mm. You know. So so I then work backwards from that moment. You know. So that so that everything that I come up with, every shot that I think of, every bit of blocking, every bit of staging that I'm thinking about during prep, which by the way can change when you're shooting. Right. But but you have to sort of think this stuff out in advance. It informs everything. Because what happens a lot of times with a lot of TV directors, and I see this all the time, even on my show, as a producing director um, on, on Kung Fu, and I was a producing director on another show called Siren, which was a mermaid show uh, for Freeform, um, and then another show before that for Disney. But um, I find that a lot of TV directors came in, and they have the same sort of by rote kind of directing. They'll do a master, mm-hmm. then they'll do a medium shot, and then they'll do an over and an over, and then they'll do singles, singles, and then they'll move on. And every show looks exactly the same. Right. And there's no thought process to how am I going to cover this and shoot this to tell the story that's on the page. Right. And there's usually a singular way of doing it. And I think it was, I think, I think David Fincher, I think this, I'm going to butcher his quote, but he said, there are two ways of shooting a scene and one of them is wrong. <laughs> you know? right. so, and, and, and he's right. Uh, because what your job is as a director is not to just show up on set and say action and wear your sunglasses and sit at the monitor and look cool. What your job is when you're a director is to look at the script and break it down, what's the scene about, who is the scene about, and then what's the best way to tell that story. Another example I was giving earlier, it's kind of like an author who can craft a novel, right, in such a way that he'll get to the bottom of the page and the author will, will say, and the killer is 
making you physically flip the page. Mm -hmm. That's craft. Right. To make you have to do a physical act of flipping the page is something that was thought out. He laid out that page, or she laid out that page in such right. a way that it made you do a physical act of turning the page. The reveal. <laughs> As a filmmaker, that's what we do. Right. We, we tell a story with a camera, and there is a specificity to it. The directors that, we, that stand out mm -hmm. in all of our heads are people that, that guide us when they're telling us a story. It's like, look here. No, don't look there. Look over here now. Don't look at that. Look right. over here. And that's what you want. You, you want someone that is, is telling you a story in a way that can only be told one way. That seems obvious when you see it, but it was all thought out. And it's all craftsmanship. It's all laying out specifically. Um, the, the, you know, I, I always say, if, if, if you start with the end of the scene first, and you figure out, this is how the scene is ending, you could then work backwards, because now you know how to start it, because you know where you're going. Right. So you start backwards. And, if, and if, it, it's all these little craft tricks that you, that, that you do, but it starts with identifying what it is. In television, like when you, when you do a movie, it all starts and stops with the director. So I'm the one that's making these decisions. When right. you're doing TV, even me, I'm working for the showrunner. I'm working for the writer of the show who created the show. So in the, the case of Kung Fu, um, Christina Kim, who created the show, I have what's called a tone meeting with her. I've done my homework. So now when we go through the script, scene by scene, we do a page turner. We're talking about every single scene specifically, and we're talking about whose scene it is, and these are the beats that we need, and this is a key moment. Make sure we get a close-up of that. You know, okay, we, we, we don't need that. Make sure that you get... And so it's all talked about, down to the most minute detail. Right. Um, same thing with Terry Metalis on Star Trek. We're talking about... Because like one of my episodes, for instance, of Picard, um, was the, they came up with a way... You know, because John Luke Picard has been around since I was in high school, right? Because you know, and so like, what do we know that's new about Picard? They actually tried to find a new way, you know, uh, or like a new backstory, right, for John Luke Picard. And so Patrick Stewart was was having a hard time with it because he hadn't ever worked that storyline out. So he and I, over various Zoom sessions, which is by the way fascinating to do. Zoom sessions with Patrick Stewart is, is, <laughs> right, is, is, is it's a blast. It's a blast, and then and, and, and an absolute gentleman. Somebody was asking me earlier. He's a great guy, like a like a like a super, you know, you know, gentleman. But it's it's working out, the, you know, the whys. Right. You know, well, why is this happening, and, and how does this? And so, because I knew Star Trek, I could relate it back to things that he had done. And the moment that we broke it down to the most minute details, when we got on set, there was no thinking. It was just executing. Wow. No, that, that's interesting. And I was actually going to ask, ask you, uh, working with, with actors in television, particularly when you come in in season two and these characters have already been established. Because, you know, in a movie, you're developing this character with the actor from the beginning. You're involved in the casting. As a TV director, oftentimes you're not involved in any of that. Right? And especially an iconic character that you said has been around for a couple of generations now. Uh, I find it fascinating that even then you're able to work with this actor to discover new things about, like I said, a character that's existed, you know, for so many years, right? Well, it was specific to that episode because of the way that episode was was written. Mm. So that episode was they wrote this backstory that we find out essentially in in the episode why John Luke Picard became right. a Starfleet captain. Like, what's the thing that motivated him to become right. a captain? Which, weirdly, had never been explored in any of the shows or in any of the movies. Like, what was his motivating? sort of moment in his life and so I thought that was fascinating to, to find out and it was a tragedy in his life I'm not going to spoil it for anybody that hadn't seen it but, uh, but it was fascinating to explore that with him and that was specific to the writing otherwise you're not coming in especially on a show that's been around for a while and inventing anything because these actors you know I always say that you know like Patrick Stewart is the head of the John Luke Picard department like right. he's, he's the head of that department. Like he knows that character better. So there's nothing that I'm going to come in and say, well, actually, this is what, you know. Like, <laughs> right, so right. it's more at that point, really, unless it's a specific episode like that one, it's more about blocking and staging and, and how to bring out, because we both understand what the script is saying if we've done our homework. We both know where we're going mm -hmm. if, if, if we've done our homework. So we're both on the same page. Right. So now it's on set. It's how do we tell that story? And then that's what right. the conversations are. So, like for instance, like Sean Bean on 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 Snowpiercer was the same way. Like th I, there was nothing that I could tell Sean Bean about his character Wilford that he hadn't already worked out. Hmm. So it would have been arrogant of me to come in. Well, I think Wilford would do this. Instead, I under I I made sure to watch every episode, and I had watched every episode, so right. I understood Wilford just like he did. 
So when he would talk to me about Wilford, I was like, yes, exactly. And how about if? And then, and, and, you know, do those kind of things. Like, well, what if? What if you did this? Ooh, yeah, you know. And so you give these, you know, sort of ideas and you plant little seeds and then let the actor, and, and, and you know, you see it in their eyes. Like, they so light up. a suggestion and then they just kind of go they, with it. They right. light up. They and light when up, you give right. something that they could play and something active, right. you know, you don't tell someone, you know, hey, be happy. Right. You know, right. you could be happy in a number of ways, you know, yeah. so you got to give something active, you know, you know, it's like, how about at this moment is like eating ice cream for the first time, you know, or whatever. And then yeah. like, and they're like, oh, I can, yes, I know what that feels like. And then they could be happy eating, you know, they're, they're using that memory to be a certain level of happy. Um, right. it, it, so it, it becomes that, but, you know, it all, it all depends on if you've done your homework in prep, because the show, either the movie or the episode is made in the prep and not on set. Right, no, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it's on the preparation and the leading up to it. And, and so, you know, as you continue your journey now, um, what do you sort of see next for you in terms of your career? Are you happy where you are? Uh, do you anticipate going back to a feature in the future? Uh, or are you just really now in your happy place in terms of the types of things you're directing? I, I really am happy in television. I'm not saying that I would never make another movie. Um, I certainly would if, a, if, if you know, an opportunity came along. But right now, I'm doing the stuff that I want to do in, mm. in television. And I think right now, I'm enjoying the, the producing side of it, which I, you know, as much as I'm enjoying the directing side of it, because as a producing director, I'm sort of overseeing all the directors. Right. And I find that it's just as gratifying to help a director try to get his or her idea a- across. So nothing excites me more when I'm sitting at, a production meeting or a concept meeting with another director and he or she will pitch something and I get really excited about it. And then the producer is like, well, that's going to be expensive. And then I'm like, hang on a second. We could work this out. And then so, <laughs> so now as a director, I'm trying to help him or her get the idea and then I'm talking to the, to, to the money and I'm saying, this could happen. Here's how. If you did this, we could do it. Don't worry. I'll go talk to him. So you become sort of an ally huh. with, the, with the director. And, the producer. and I, so I find that part of it really fascinating. So I certainly want to keep p- producing um, it, it, you know, uh, and, and inevitably, you know, have our own show. You know, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the, 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 you know. I, and I think that's sort of the next phase of things. Is you know, there's one thing to be a director for hire and be a producer on someone else's show. It's another thing to be a director and a producer on your own show and nurture something from the beginning. Absolutely, from the beginning, correct. Yes. Yeah, so you can create your own Picard one day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so and and let's before we turn over to Q and A, to bring it full circle. <coughs> What's it been like for you? I know you, it was just recent, uh, continuing to work at such a high level in the industry, but now uh, back in Florida again. Well, it's, it's, I, I've been wanting to move back home. And, and I've always said, even though I was in L.A. for 30 years, I would always say, whenever I was coming to Miami, I'd always say, I'm going home for Christmas, going wow. home for the summer. I, I, it just instinctively was always saying home. Um, and so I've been finding a way to get back as much as possible. The thing about L.A. is that you, it's, it's kind of you have to go. Like if you're going to be, sure. it, it's, it's, it's hard to, it's not that it's impossible, but it's hard to do the job, specifically what, what, what I do, and start and stay here or stay anywhere. You kind of have to go and you kind of have to kind of, you know, do your time yes. <laughs> in Los Angeles. Um, but I got to a point where the phone was ringing and no, no, number one. And number two, most of the things that I was doing were not in L.A. And that was the game changer. Right. When suddenly I was shooting in Vancouver or I was shooting in Texas, I was shooting in New Orleans or right. wherever or Toronto. Suddenly I was like, I don't have to be here. Hmm. I don't have to be in L.A. Everywhere that I'm shooting is not L.A. In fact, Star Trek Picard was the first show that I did in L.A. in about six, seven years. It was like six, seven years that I had done a show in L.A. Everything had been out of town. Um, so, and ironically... We had just sold our house and moved, and then I got the show in L.A. Wow. So then I had to rent the house in L.A. I had to go ah. back. So after living in L.A. for 30 years... Every time to go, I try to get out. Yeah. I had to, <laughs> but that was... But, like, when, when the phone starts ringing and you don't have to be in L.A. because the shows aren't really... And actually, even if the shows were being made in L.A. Right. And it always reminds me of the HBO film I really love, uh, The Life and Death of Peter Sellers. And when uh, Peter first gets to Rome at Cinecittà... And he meets his Pink Panther director who says, welcome to Hollywood. He's like, my boy, we're in Rome. He's like, Hollywood is a state of mind. 
That's exactly right. <laughs> and on that and, note, <laughs> yeah, and that's why I'm hoping that I, I, what, what, what my big dream is to find more things to do here. Right. And, and so ultimately, I want to be able to sleep in my own bed. So that's ultimately my. As I get older, I, I want to get to a point where I can go to work here and not Vancouver or yes, Toronto or that's wherever. A great motivation. Yes. Uh, all right, so let's turn it over to our audience for a few questions for Mr. Joe Menendez. Right here? Well, I, I think it's safe to assume you have a lot less time to work on a TV project that you're directing. Is it ever a problem, because this, this has happened to me I, I, when I've done a non-professional thing where there's something I don't like, you know, maybe a year later, but with TV you have even less time to work on it. Do you ever immediately think, oh, I should have done something differently? Is that ever a problem with All the time. Guys? All the time. The, the, you know, whether it's the immediacy of TV is what you're talking about, that you shoot something like and it's on the air within a few months where if you make a movie, you're working on it for a year and a half or whatever. Um, I find, and I think that the moment that any one of us as filmmakers say, I am 100% satisfied from beginning to end with that project, at that point, just retire. And at that point, go do something else. Because I think we're all, we, we should all have a, 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 a sort of constant state of learning. Um, and so I, I have yet, to do my perfect sort of <laughs> magnum opus, if, if you will. Like, everything I do, I, you know, I, I mean, even the stuff that's up here is, to me, I, I just look at the flaws. You know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm not looking at the things that went well, I'm looking at the things that, like, I gotta do that better. And the same way I did with the VHS tapes, right. where I would deconstruct, I will constantly look at my work and go, that could be better. I see what I did there. So, yes, the, that sense of not having satisfied, you know, like, like not being satisfied is a common thing with, with filmmakers. I don't know if that was a question you asked or not. No, that's what I was asking. Yeah. Is it even worse for TV and you're saying short? Well, because it's so quick. So, <laughs> yeah, so what I, I actually, to that point, I, you know, so I directed the finale of Kung Fu this past season, and from the point that we finished it, like literally finished the last VFX, it was a lot of VFX shots, to the moment it aired was like a month. It was like less than a month. Like we finished it. And I look at that and I'm like, I wish I had more time to work on that. And, you know, and, I'm, and I, I, I wish I had done that shot differently, but it's on the air. There's an, there's an like I, like for season three, because we're on season three of Kung Fu, we have a production calendar, and we see here's our prep date, here's our production date, and here's our post date, and here's our air date. And that's it. There's no, there's no asking for more time. There's no like, I need three more weeks. There's no Ridley Scott slash George Lucas thing where you can change it. There's no, I cannot change the air date. The air date is locked in. They have sole time on that. And so you have to deliver the episode. And there's a point that you have to give it up. And you just go, of course. there it is. That's what the show is. And you can't stand up while someone's watching the show on TV and like, that could have been better if. Like, that's, <laughs> It's, that's the show, and that will live on forever. And, and that's why sometimes you see directors go back and they recut things, because we all do it. We all look at things and go, oh, God. So that, 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 that's common, it's very common. Just one last thing, this will be quicker than the other. Sorry, I asked a lot of questions. Um, all good, man. With um, how you're saying, you know, it's, it is harder to get started, you know, with, by doing things remotely, but it's still possible. Mm -hmm. Would you say that the whole thing of not having to be there makes everything even more competitive? It's competitive no matter what, because right now Hollywood is a state of mind, and Hollywood has become global. So right now we're not competing. This, me included, this is everybody in this room. We're competing with people from all over the world right. who who have access to the exact same. I've I've shot two movies in the Dominican Republic, and the equipment that we use was exactly the same equipment that I've used on every show that I've been on. There's no like they get the lesser cameras or the lesser whatever. They, it's it's all the same. So it really comes down to talent. And it comes down to filmmakers' abilities to be able to do things. So why I say it's difficult but not impossible is because there are movies and TV shows getting made all over the world all the time that get the attention of you know, the Netflix and the Amazons and all that. So it's absolutely possible. It's just it's harder because there's this weird sense in LA that if you're not there, like, well, you're the, this other. You know? and, and it's this weird 
thing that you have to kind of get over, and you, you have to almost apply like, yes, I'm this, like I'm from Miami, or I'm from Spain, or wherever, but this is why I'm great, and this is why I'm undeniable, because my project has won all these accolades, or it's, it's made all this money, or whatever. Like there's this movie from India right now, this movie called RRR, I don't know if anybody's seen it. Um, it's, it, it's, it's on Netflix. It's one of the most amazing, it's an Indian movie. It's one of the most amazing things you'll ever see in your life. I guarantee you that that director now, who's only made movies in India, will, within the next couple of years, be making some big Hollywood blockbuster. There's no doubt about it. It's that good of a movie. So, it, it does happen. You just gotta make something that's undeniable. Mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, it's so great thank advice. Thank you very much. We got time for a couple more questions. One over here. That would be me, Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, <laughs> so my question, uh, you mentioned you still have, uh, like, a magnum opus, like something you have your, your, your inner eye kind of set on. Is it something that you're actively developing right now, writing and with certain friends, or are you on the hunt for that material and your reps are kind of starting to put things in front of you for the future? How is that process working for you? Well, it's all the above, and, and I certainly am hoping that I find that, 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 that but like, I can't say, well, this is it, because every project that we make, we go into it hoping that it's the, the greatest thing in the world. We want everything that we make. I might be, have it. You know, I don't know. You might have it. I was trying to pitch you now. I think no, I got it. I, I may have it. I'll, I'll pick it up. He's putting down. Yes. Just a But 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 we 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 all go into everything that we make uh, and develop, hoping that it's the next Stranger Things. Like we all go into these things, hoping that we've got the thing that's going to be the thing. <laughs> you know. Um, but I can. I, for me, I, I you know, and I think it's my working class roots. I can't ever go into something saying. This is going to be an artistic masterpiece because I think the moment that you do that, you're you're you're, it's pretentious. You know, it's like you get to, you know, and it's never going to be art. I, I think I look at this is going to sound terrible, but I look at directing, um, like uh, again, it, it's a craft. Like somebody made this chair, right? But somebody designed this chair too. So the the, the main purpose of this chair is for me to sit, put my butt on. But there's a bit of artistry to this chair, right? Like that was thought out. That's how I look at, at, at what I do. I'm telling a story with a camera, and I'm, you know, hoping to entertain, and if it happens to be a work of art, then right. fantastic. But that's not what I set out to do. Right. That's like, because I think the moment you do that, it informs the wrong things. You're not trying to make a story, you're trying to make a work of art. And, like, we're storytellers. Like, that's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And on that note, you are one of our great storytellers, and thank you so much for doing this, Joe Menendez. This has been a great honor. It's been fantastic. So uh, everyone, once again, give it up for Joe Menendez. Woo!